Nair. Uh, so we, we, we are talking today about the Russian church in 1927, 1937. And in the spring of 1927, Metropolitan Sergius, who was a substitute to the local tenants of the patriarchal throne, a substitute to Metropolitan Peter, who was in various, uh, in various forms of captivity, starting with 1925. So Metropolitan Sergei, he was suddenly released and uh, he uh, received the right to have his uh, office registered as a patriarchal office. And uh, a few months later, he was released in the spring. He came up with his declaration, with his appeal, when he was trying, following in the steps of Patriarch Tikhon, to convince the Soviet authority the church is loyal, and also uh, blaming for, uh, for uh, the problems, for, for mistrust between the church, or, or lack of the trust from the uh, state for the church, blaming on uh, the plotters, the plotters uh, from uh, abroad. So, and of course he didn't have a chance. He wasn't free to discuss the whole picture. He, he lived in a outer, uh, authoritarian, if not totalitarian society where everything was uh, regulated by inner instructions and uh, uh, so it wasn't free uh, society where he could can where he could discuss the picture in all its complexity. So Metropolitan Sergius apparently he uh, tried, not even maybe apparently he tried to alleviate the situation of the church. That's what he wanted to demonstrate that I did all this for the sake of the church, and I trust him on this because he uh, sent an appeal to the Soviet secret police with the list of uh, clergy who were arrested, ask them to uh, be uh, to be released. Then three years later, 1930, Metropolitan Sergei, he, he sent another document, another memorandum where he asked, when he pointed out to, uh, to the, uh, uh, to various forms of persecutions against the Russian church that Russian church experienced in the Soviet state. Okay, so, but one of the things that was uh, kind of distinguished and distinguished Metropolitan Sergei from Patriarch Tikhon was that Patriarch Tikhon, maybe because of his personality, he didn't really follow through on his, uh, on his decisions, right? And Metropolitan Sergei, he did follow through uh, until he would get to the bottom of the, of the issue. Like Patriarch Tikhon, he prescribed the Soviet authorities would be commemorated. He never followed through on this because it wasn't popular, right? Uh, that Soviet authority would be commemorated on litanies, right? Uh, sort of uh, our country and our government. Uh, but uh, Metropolitan Sergei did follow through uh, and required and even sent uh, dean, deans of deaneries in Moscow that they would go to churches and, and see whether in fact it was commemorated or not. So that was one of the things that he uh, either decided either it was his own thing or he was required uh, that, uh, that he wouldn't just let people pay lip service to whatever they were required as it was with Patriarch Tikhon. Patriarch Tikhon closed down the Russian uh, administration, the diaspora, Supreme Russian administration, the diaspora, but he, he never really uh, issued any concrete uh, decrees against the, the new form of the government that was uh, uh, recreated in abroad. So, and, but that what Metropolitan Sergei took up on himself to follow through uh, and uh, uh, demanding that all Russian, all Russian clergymen would supply pledge of allegiance, pledge of legion, allegiance, uh, uh, loyalty to uh, to the Soviet government, and this of course became very divisive issue because 
most of the Russian clergymen, they were stateless. They didn't, they, they were not Soviet citizens. I don't think there were any Soviet citizens actually. So, and then some of them already became foreign citizens. So foreign subjects, then how, how would, how would it work? What do you mean? He didn't really, un I think he sent a clarification later on that it was, uh, that it, that he meant in a sense that they would abstain in their public, uh, public uh, pronouncements from any, from any hostility, hostility towards the Soviet regime. So uh, some of the clergymen, including uh, Bishop Veniamin, who was very, very active in Wrangel's control Crimea and was also very involved with the foundation of the Russian Church abroad in Constantinople in 1920. He decided to serve, he was a spiritual man, he decided to serve 40 liturgies. And there is his work, uh, which is called Moisar Kaust. So he was in Serbia and he was serving 40 liturgies, praying that God would reveal to him what to do in this. So at the end of that, at the end of that he decided he decided to join Metropolitan Sergius and give this pledge of allegiance. And because of that, he breached, uh, he breached uh, with, uh, with uh, the Supreme Church authority abroad. But Metropolitan and any bishops around him, they from the get-go, they refused to subordinate. And as a result, they proclaimed themselves autonomous in order to uh, remove any responsibility from the church in Russia for their further activities, to prevent the church in Russia from accusations as, as it were made for Patriarch Tikhon, uh, that Patriarch Tikhon in fact uh, was uh, a similarly mind, like-minded to those in the diaspora only with the difference that he couldn't speak freely in, this, in the Soviet territory, but that he also he wanted to destruction of the Soviet regime and so on. So in order to uh, not to give any chances in the future for such uh, accusations, uh, they, uh, the bishops, Russian, Russian immigrant bishops decided to self-govern until the normal the, the normal, the time for, for normal communication would come. So that's actually what was the reason. And a uh, majority of Russian refugee clergy refused to send such, uh, uh, such pledge of allegiance. I haven't talked to you, and I would like to do it right now, uh, about uh, the divisions in the Russian diaspora. You read that uh, paper about uh, Patriarch Tikhon's closure of the Russian Supreme Authority abroad in 1922, right? And uh, Metropolitan Yevlogi, who was, like you see, there is this decree 348, 349, because number 348 was for Metropolitan and number 349 was for Metropolitan Yevlogi. Metropolitan Yevlogi, to whom this decree was addressed, refused to follow, to follow this because he realized that it's something that not going to do any good for the Russian diaspora. But then in 1926, he changed his mind and he uh, separated from the Council of Russian Bishops in Serbia, he in Metropolitan Platon, he left this Council of Bishops and decided to be directly on the church in Russia. So Metropolitan Yevlogi in 1927, he gave himself this pledge of allegiance to Metropolitan Sergei regarding the Soviet uh, authority. Uh, and uh, his clergy do, did the same. And when I say his clergy, it means clergy in the Western Europe. So like historically, if you think right now about France, you know, think, you think about Belgium, if you think about, if you think about, uh, well, back then, back then, there were, of course, French colonies throughout Africa, right? Or even French departments like Algier. Algier was French department. It was like part of France. It wasn't really a colony or anything like that. That's why there was the famous battle for Algier in the 1960s, because it was like French territory. Like Martinique is nowadays, it's also like department of France. It's really the same territory people people hold French passports there. So all those territories 
they were served by clergy of metropolitan Yvlogi, who had his base in Paris. And that is Rue de Rue, Church of St. Alexander Nevsky, that two years ago in, in 2019 joined surprisingly to me the Russian church. So this is historical, historical remnant, uh, not remnant, just historical successors to Metropolitan Yvlogi. So uh, in 1930s, three years later, Metropolitan Yvlogi was invited by Archbishop of Canterbury, the head of, not the head, uh, the, uh, the leading Archbishop of the Anglican Church to participate in a special rally, a special march for the persecuted Russian church. So Archbishop Anastasi was also there from Jerusalem. And uh, Yvlogi came there and uh, read a prayer, returned back to Paris and received a query from Moscow, asking to give an account about breaching, breaching his, uh, his uh, promises, I guess, not to get involved in politics. And Metropolitan Yvlogi became furious because it's sort of like praying for the persecuted Russian church does this mean politics. And apparently it did mean politics for Metropolitan Sergei because it would recognize the fact of persecution. The Metropolitan Sergei, he worked very hard to establish relationship with Soviet authorities. The Soviet authorities would finally uh, trust the Russian church. That was official line. And suddenly there is his own RB Metropolitan who undermines this. So with this in mind, Metropolitan Yvlogi realized that he could not remain uh, under, he came to the same conclusion as Russian immigrant bishops did three years ago. But at this time, he was already suspended by Rocker Council. He was suspended. And in order to make things clear, uh, there was special, uh, special uh, epistle that uh, qualified the mysteries of Yvlo sacraments of Yvlogians Yvlo void of grace. To make it clearer for people, kind of, it cannot be more simple. You just don't go there because there is no grace. Yes, brother one. Oh, uh, the voice of grace. Void. The uh, void of grace. Void of grace. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, 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 absence of salvific grace in in their sacraments. They are just forms. Right. And that's something I talked to you earlier which uh, to me mirrors Metropolitan Sergius' approach in Russia, because all situations were extraordinary to say at least. So kind of from the distance, I would say, why won't you just let Metropolitan Evlogi to carry on and then everybody would give account to the Russian church when basically, when smoke will, uh, how to say, dispersed when so, but both Metropolitan Sergei in our bishops, in uh, Rocker bishops, they acted as they would represent absolute authority, sort of like as it was in St. Petersburg. Because Metropolitan Sergei, he was a substitute to locum tenens. It's not even in books, no job descriptions for this. So, and then Rocker bishops, they were in charge of unprecedented network of parishes throughout the globe, united by ethnic principle, it's no precedent to this. So, but both parties, they acted as they were, as they were in St. Petersburg during the synodal period, as it were sort of absolutely clearly recognized canonical authority. Our, one of our fathers, Georgeville fathers and, and great iconographer uh, and the father confessor and uh, our bishops, our Vladikas Luke, spiritual father, Father Kiprian Pejov. He was a young man in Nice, in France at this time, attending church there. And a priest in Nice was a widely, widely respected, widely respected uh, father confessor, Father Confessor Alexander Yelchininov. And his wife, 
was uh, an iconographer who taught Father Kiprian to, uh, to, 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 to become an iconographer. And Father Kiprian told the story that the Kursk group icon, which of course was in the Russian church abroad, was visiting Nice uh, and was brought to this church. And his father confessor was a Yevlogian, as most of the clergy in France. So uh, a priest, possibly Father Boris Kritsky, who was a custodian like Vladika Nikolai nowadays of the icon, brought this icon to the church. And Father Alexander Yelchininov showed up as he's supposed to be in his epitrophilian, right? Because of the, of the moment of meeting meeting uh, or like mother of God herself in, in, in the image of this icon. And this custodian priest, a rocker priest, told to a Vlogian priest, Father Alexander, Atec Alexander, snimite pajalosti epitrahil. Okay, so Father Alexander, please take your epitrahil on with the assumption that he was suspended. So this uh, division contributed a lot to how to say, instead of focusing on what is one thing is needful, Yedina in a Patriabu, instead of focusing on uh, personal deification and personal cleansing, right? People were focused on the falls of other parties. There were debates, all Russian, because Russian refugee society understandably was already highly politicized due to the traumas that people experienced by losing their homeland, by going through the events of unprecedented revolution, of civil war, of fratricide, uh, and then uh, leave, uh, losing their homeland. They didn't want to, to go freely like many of us. They didn't go on free, uh, uh, of reveal. They, were, they had to leave their Russia, so they were traumatized. And on top of this, now there is a short division. So you, you are a Vlogian and you are a Karlovite and so on. Luckily, luckily, Metropolitan Anthony, he demonstrated his broadness, his outstanding broad mindness, that he himself undermined the decision on 1926 and he agreed to invite Yvlogi in 1935 uh, uh, while both of them were still alive to come to Serbia. And both of them read a prayer of absolution over each other. And Yvlogi was admitted to serve with Rocker bishops next day. But many our people were scandalized because they believed the Metropolitan Anthony, he acted above of his pay grade. Since it was conciliar decision, it was not up to him. But just think about if, if they would wait for a council and whole thing would start it, it would never be resolved. Because there are always when people would sit around on one hand, on another hand, there will be another open appeal and nothing would happen. But sort of a huge thing about this when, that when the World War II happened, right? and Russian refugees started to, Russian displaced process started to arrive in big number from the Soviet Union. They were preached Christ instead of being preached jurisdictions by both parties. This narrative, don't go to this church, there is, there is no grace. They, it, 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 it wasn't on the table. That's what I think was providential. And this is something that church in Russia, in homeland dealt with Right, so Metropolitan Sergei, he suspended Metropolitan Joseph of Petrograd, who was removed by Sergei from Petrograd and sent to Odessa. And Joseph was very loved in St. Petersburg, in Petrograd, in Leningrad, properly to say. And he refused to obey. Right, that's problematic, right, because you're not supposed to do this. But uh, he believes that it was done by the uh, ass assignment from the Soviet secret police, which it was. So he refused to obey, started his own movement in St. Petersburg. This movement was associated with conservative uh, direction, conservative trend in the Russian church. They, their church was Church Spas and Kravi, 
right? The church that was built on the spot where Alexander II was, uh, was assassinated and killed. That was their church. And many people joined them and a number of other bishops were suspended. And uh, his weaker bishop, Bishop Sergei Druzhinin, was just recently also uh, canonization of the Russian church abroad of 1981 was recently last year confirmed by the Russian church. So his weaker, who was like-minded person against Metropolitan Sergei, nevertheless now is a, a saint of the whole of the, of the unified Russian church. And that demonstrates basically how history deals with this, how it is hard to, hard to uh, use one size fits all approach. Okay, so Metropolitan Sergei, he uh, confronted this opposition, which was called uh, in uh, uh, Moscow Patriarchate early historiography as Prava Opposition, comparing with uh, renovationists. Basically, their line was their renovationist, their schism from the left and there are, there are other, other schismatics from the right, right? But we don't know about renovationist clergy who were canonized, but we know a number of clergy who were very, very critical and suspended by Metropolitan Sergius. Nevertheless, it didn't prevent them, didn't prevent them uh, from uh, canonization by the Russian church. Okay, so, in 1921, it was an important year when the Soviet Union adopted the new law, new law on the religion that I don't think ever was canceled, right? Maybe it just became redundant de facto in the late Soviet Union. But I think uh, some parts of this law remained, remained, uh, remained uh, valid in the sense that children were prohibited from teaching religion, right? Uh, and uh, church was put uh, under more strict supervision. And uh, the law was that in order to uh, register church community, you need to have this number varied. 10 people, 20 people, they were called desiatki, dvatsatki. Uh, to register your community, you need to just uh, officially, it was quite simple. You need to state your purpose, your goal, and, and the church would give you, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the state would give you a building to pray. So if you look at this document, it's sort of like getting driver license, I guess. Uh, so everything straightforward. But again, as I, as, I, as I keep saying, reality was more complex. What was under the table really defined the matter. And the reality was that uh, the Soviet authority didn't want new churches to open. And they would even try to reduce the number of those people and force them to voluntary petitions that they don't need a church. They have just very few people. They are very happy to whatever, pray at home or not to pray or something like that. So that's how many churches were closed down, destroyed, and so on. Or the, the, the state would not let a priest to serve there because priests didn't have a registration. So, and that's why church was considered a vacant building and would be closed as well. But it was catch 22 because uh, a priest wouldn't have this registration exactly because the state would not provide him with the one. So I hope this gives that gives you this taste of the time, right? So it gives you that one thing to, to, to discuss this uh, in Jordanville and another thing to face it. That's, I think, we take a lot of stuff for granted. And as I mentioned before, those of our fathers who found themselves within the Soviet reach after the war, uh, they, uh, they realized how it was different. One thing to speak, whatever they felt like from the comfort of abroad, another thing uh, to, face, uh, to face 
immediate consequences of your of your wars or, or not just even wars just to pay price for for being church men right so uh A, a major a major figure that I think the most solidly represented opposition to Metropolitan Sergius was Saint Metropolitan Kirill of uh, Kazan, who also was who also was in captivity, who sent three epistles to Metropolitan Sergius. He received, I think, a couple of responses. Another thing that Metropolitan Sergius should be credited that he did correspond with his opponents and he tried to unpack his rationale. So those uh, correspondence can be found in Acti Patriarcha Tichana published by St. Tichon's University for the Humanities in 1994, right? As there is also English translations of those uh, things, right? Um, so, a uh, metropolitan Kirill, he stood up for conciliarity. He wanted to, that things would be discussed, like Metropolitan Sergio's declaration was received with critical comments from those bishops who were uh, in prison, uh, imprisoned in Solovetsky Monastery in Slon, Solovetsky Lager Asobovo Nuznachenie. At the same time, I would like to say that those bishops, those bishops who surrounded Metropolitan Sergius, who uh, joined his synod, they were good bishops. That's another thing. Many of them uh, became also new martyrs. So the Russian church was divided. Right, Russian church was divided. Uh, and uh, Metropolitan Sergei was supported. He supported by many bishops, but it boils down for me to this major question, decentralization versus centralization. So we can somehow reconstruct both passes we can see that Russian church paid huge tributes by maintaining open. And I think already in 1991, the newly elected, I think it was during Lent, the Frost Lent actually, after his election, Patriarch Alexis the Frost, he asked forgiveness for many compromises that he had to do, to do in his position as Upravlyayushi Medilami, as Chancellor of the Office of Moscow Patriarchate, because there were situations where people would come from province, like from Kirov region, asking uh, Moscow Patriarchate to defend their churches from closure, and church could not do anything. So basically, they would let them back empty-handed. And So, uh, the Journal of Moscow Patriarchate was allowed to be published in 1931, only to be closed in three year times, in three year time. And uh, uh, in 1931, the Christ Savior Cathedral was destroyed with the idea of building monument to Lenin, but because grounds were so, uh, the, the grounds would not really, uh, would not really uh, hold this construction of this Lenin's sort of Babylon style uh, tomb, uh, not a monument. So they, they could not do anything. They end up with having a, a swimming pool there that, that lasted until the church was restored after the Soviet Union. So Metropolitan Sergius in 1933, he petitioned, I believe his former student, because Metropolitan Sergius, he taught at, the, at St. Petersburg Theological Academy. And his former student at this time was no less than Patriarch of Serbia, uh, Patriarch Barnava. So he petitioned Patriarch Varnava to be 
to be a mediator between him and Russian refugees. So he wanted that Russian refugee bishops would finally, would finally uh, follow his command, his order to submit uh, pledges of uh, allegiance to the Soviet government. So Patriarch Varnava, he not fully really endorsed Rocker position. He extremely, he was very respectful to Patriarch uh, Metropolitan Antoni. But at the same time, he didn't really subscribe to extreme views regarding Metropolitan Sergius. He considered him the head of the Russian church. One of the uh, annual calendars of the Serbian church came out with Metropolitan Sergius picture that like a suffering leader of the Russian church and so on. But he really wanted to find common grounds, but at the same time, he believed the Russian church abroad had its own mission. He believed it's totally canonical. He, he wouldn't really agree with Metropolitan Sergius. And I mentioned to you today about this 1935 agreement when the Russian church as a diaspora was reconciled. Huge part of this was Serbian king. By one account, by contemporary, which ideally would have been need, need, needs to be verified, but uh, this account, according to this account, Petri, uh, King Alexander of Serbia, he said to Rocker bishops that he is not going to support them if they would not reconcile with Metropolitan Evlogi. So, be this as it may, they reconciled, and there was. Uh, uh, the uh, Russian metropolitan districts, I mean, metropolitan districts that were discussed at the Council 1917-1918 were implemented. Okay, so uh, since they didn't reach any agreement, this, this uh, negotiations through Patriarch Varnava didn't reach any agreements. Uh, Patriarch Varnava, he suggested that rocker bishops would be just part of the Serbian church, that he would make all of them Serbian, church, Serbian churchmen. Because right now, clergymen in Serbia were, were, church, were Serbian clergymen, but bishops were, uh, had, had uh, their extraterritoriality. They were considered bishops of the Russian church. And at the end of this conversation, uh, Metropolitan Sergi refused to follow this because he said they would continue their schismatic activity under your flag. So it's not going to, 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 to be good. And so uh, bishops were suspended in 1934, okay? Uh, when we had this reconciliation in 2007, all acts of mutual hostility were canceled. That's also what keeps me, how to say, what makes me to be double, how to say, careful. It doesn't mean that I cannot critically assess history, but it means that I don't think, uh, I, I think time for polemics, for polemics, for using names, for using value judgment things is past. Still, you can say what you believe uh, to for full, full picture, but sort of very heated polemics that we used to have, uh, luckily, uh, is out of fashion. So, and what I'm, I'm saying about this, I'm saying about it, is that it also means that those acts of suspension by Moscow Patriarchate, they, they were annulled by this, uh, by this decision to 2007, right? So, uh, in 1937, it's an year when Russian Episcopate was, how to say, systematically, systematically uh, annihilated. If you just think about August, September, October, November, there are bishops and bishops and bishops who were martyred, including uh, Saint Joseph of Petrograd, who was killed uh, in the same checkmate. Uh, uh, the same Chikment uh, prison uh, in Kazakhstan with uh, Metropolitan uh, Kirill. And there is even uh, icon of the synaxis of the Russian new martyrs, 
And on this icon of the synaxis of the Russian New Martyrs, you see there is one body without a halo, and this is supposed to be Metropolitan Joseph, because Metropolitan Joseph was not canonized by the Russian church. So, oh, his proper canonization was not recognized. Right. This uh, directive about uh, annihilation of Russian bishops, right, is connected with the uh, uh, imperative to uh, uh, imperative to destroy to destroy religion by the end of 1930s, right? So a general attempt that uh, people would not know how to write the name of God that it was, uh, it, it used to be written with capital, with capital B, with, with capital G, right? And they succeeded in some sense that people didn't know that God was uh, written with uh, big, uh, with capital B, right? I was saying to you that 1935, there was reconciliation in the Russian diaspora. Uh, in Serbia, in 1935, there were Metropolitan Yevlogi, Metropolitan Theophil, who succeeded to Metropolitan Platon, the head of North American Metropolia, which is now uh, OCA, right, the OCA. So this agreement of 1935 only worked for America because when Metropolitan uh, Yevlogi came back to Paris, his advisors were not happy about this. And they decided we are not going to implement those decisions. We just will carry on as we were. So luckily, suspensions were removed from Metropolitan Yevlogi, but at the same time, he did not become part of the larger Russian church abroad because idea was, the plan was that those metropolitans will be in charge of big metropolitan districts, as it is right now in Europe, with uh, Metropolitan Anthony, Antony, right? He's, a, he's in charge of Moscow Patriarchate Metropolitan District. And he has under him bishops, right, Brat Ivan? All right. <laughs> OK, so that was the same plan. But it only worked for America, and it's worked very beautifully for America. Rocker bishops in America, they uh, joined North American Metropolitan District, nowadays CA. They became diocesan bishops under Metropolitan. So their first port of reference was Metropolitan Theophil. And then Metropolitan Theophil would consult Rocker bishops of councils and uh, Rocker bishop councils in Serbia. Now we have two readings of this history. If you talk to some our people, they would say uh, that, and there is true, some points, they have valid points, that actually they became part of the Russian church abroad, whereas um, uh, North American uh, metropolitan district uh, people, uh, the OCA people, they would see they, they kind of were in communion with this. In, they were one immigrant foundation, there was another immigrant foundation, and they were just in communion without really being uh, hierarchically subordinated. Well, that may be debatable, but nevertheless, uh, I think their point of view has to be also mentioned. So, uh, in 1938, there were widespread celebrations of 950th anniversary of the uh, Christianity in Russia. Okay, so, and to mark the celebration, the seminary was founded in uh, New York. And I think very few people realize actually that the name was connected now of St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary with Russian emigre celebrations that were part of the ongoing events in the Russian diaspora. Again, I haven't studied this, but I'm not seeing any other points that in 1938, it was founded in this, uh, with this name. I think it's straightforward. I don't think it's co coincidental, right? So, uh, 
The second Pan-Diaspora Council took place in Serbia in 1938. There is a huge brief, huge volume available in the library uh, for acts and proceedings and so on. Russian Church abroad uh, decided in this council to continue participate in ecumenical activity. I mean, di dialogues, communications with non-Orthodox, but only when bishops and when representatives appointed by Supreme Church authority and they were able also to do it, uh, how to say, adequately, sort of speak about reservations about the Orthodox faith, right? But nevertheless, Russian Church abroad didn't really at this part, at this time, dismiss it as something that uh, wasn't that something that, uh, uh, that, that that was wrong. Okay, now uh, the Europe, uh, I mean Europe, experienced experience re general reactions on uh, political reactions. To, uh, was leaning toward right or, ex or extreme right. Uh, and it was general mood in continental Europe, right? Especially, I mean, Central Europe. If you think about uh, Serbia, right? There was a uh, very conservative, uh, conservative uh, uh, polis politics uh, connected with, uh, with, uh, at the end of the 1930s, if you think about uh, Hungary, if you think about, of course, Spain, if you think about uh, Germany, right, sort of national socialist government, if you think about uh, uh, China that was under Japanese uh, uh, occupation, that you realize that uh, by the 1939, most of the Russian church abroad, most of the territories where were perished the Russian church abroad, they were under uh, uh, under the power of Axis, of uh, uh, Axis and their allies. Axis it means uh, it means Italy, uh, Italy, Germany, and Japan, right? So they're pact, uh, and that also gives you idea uh, about uh, further developments. Moscow Patriarchate, as I, as I was mentioned. Uh, was isolated. Metropolitan Sergei, he didn't know whether he wouldn't be arrested or not. He, he, he had by the 1939 around 100 churches throughout this all Soviet Union. So, and that was his tragedy that basically what he, he did his best to convince the Soviet government that he uh, was loyal, but the Soviet government was not that interested. They interested to use him for their own purposes. And many of those churches, they were cemetery churches. Basically, church was very much pushed into ghetto. That if you are a church practitioner, so go to the cemetery. That's what you. That's where you belong. And for young people to show up in church, it wasn't wasn't realistic. That's why many people went underground, and they were. Uh, in communion with the official church, but nevertheless, they went under underground, they prayed in, in undergrounds, I mean, like uh, privately, because they didn't want any trouble, they didn't want to attract attention from the government. That's another thing. Plus, there are many people who went underground who didn't recognize Metropolitan Sergius, who didn't recognize his uh, new trend in uh, church, uh, in church uh, guidance. Okay, so, but there is always man, Manus Day, there is always God providence, or if you want to use, sort of, if you want to speak as a historian, you might say uh, there is factor of unexpected. And this factor of unexpected became uh, Molotov-Ribbentrop agreement between the Nazis Germany and the Soviet Union about spheres of influence, where Nazis uh, agreed that the Soviet Union would re annex those territories that used to be part of the Russian Empire, like Baltic states, Western Belarus, Western Ukraine, right? And the Nazis would move into Poland, and Poland was partitioned in 1931 by the Nazis and uh, the Soviets meeting in Brest. That's in just 
two years time became became a, a Russian Alamo, uh, Russian fortress defended uh, despite the fact that it was already circled by German troops and they went farther, sort of, uh, which epitom epitomized, demonstrate uh, the Russian heroism in the great patriotic war. But right now, this partition in 1939, they brought into the, in the fold of the Russian church very many parishes. So the number of parishes in the Russian church increased in, I don't know, in hundredfold. Because there was stable church life in all those territories. There were bishops and so on. What do you do with them? Are you going to just, uh, you cannot physically close all those churches. Why would you do it? It was very destructive, basically, especially that many Russians in Baltics, they expected the Soviets as liberators since like, for instance, in Latvia, there was a right-wing regime of President Ulmanis. So in many, and there also were strong trends to, uh, to assimilate Russians, change their surnames into local surnames and so on. And they idealized, they, they believe Soviet propaganda, watching Soviet movies, Bisioli, Ribiata, and other movies from the Soviets. They thought, well, the Russians are coming. They are like us. They are going to liberate us. They didn't realize that actually problems that were coming with Russians were worse than the ones they already had. So nevertheless, I think I, I'm even uh, uh, went, went farther than we're supposed to speak about. Okay, so I'm going to put this recording, I, I'm going to stop this recording uh, and let